In our life, we should have a flow of of joy, a flow of peace, a flow of the fruit of the Spirit coming out of us, a flow of goodness flowing out of us, mercy. We should have a flow of good things in our life. And when the right things are bubbling up in us and flowing out of us, we not only enjoy our lives, but we're able to be a blessing to other people. So I guess I want to ask you today, what is flowing out of you? I'll ask myself. What is flowing out of you, Joyce? Well, sometimes good stuff, and some days we just get a little spurt, and I'd like to fix that. Amen? What flows out of you is more important than what comes to you. We get way too concerned about what we're getting in life or what we're not getting or not having a bad circumstance, and God wants us to understand that it's what's in us that is much more important than what's coming to us, because if we've got the right thing in us and we get rid of the hindrances in our life, then the right thing will flow through us, and it won't only be a blessing to us, but it will be a blessing to other people. So, is a good flow being hindered in your life? Is what's coming out of us dead, or is it living? Does it minister life? Does it minister death? Is there a flow at all? Do you feel like you can't hear from God? You feel like you can't sense God's presence? There's no joy. There's no peace. Nothing seems to be working. Everything is a struggle. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like, I don't understand. I go to church. (laughs) But something's just not right. Something's just not right. Well, sometimes we've got some things clogging up our pipes. And, you know, when you're a believer but you're not living the life you should live. It's very frustrating because before you received Christ and got into the Word, you could sin all day long. It didn't bother you that much. But once you receive Christ and you start learning better, now, if you continue in that kind of a lifestyle, you will be miserable. Can I just say this, and I want you to remember this, there's nothing more miserable than a guilty conscience. A lot of people have a hard time sleeping, not everybody, obviously, but... A lot of times when you have a hard time sleeping, there's something on your conscience that's bothering you, something that you have not attended to. You know, we're very good at just glossing over things and finding some place to kind of stick it in a back room in our heart somewhere and just pretending like it doesn't exist. And I had a situation two or three years ago that I well remember where I just wasn't sleeping good, which normally wasn't the case for me, and I tossed and turned and kept waking up and didn't know what was going on. Finally, about five o'clock in the morning, I said to God, I wish I would have done it much sooner, but I said, what is wrong? (laughs) What is wrong? You know, if you ask God what's wrong and you really want to hear the truth, he'll tell you, but you may not like everything that he says. We always want our problems to be something somebody else is doing. But in that instance, quickly, God brought to my heart something that I had said a way that I had behaved that day before I went to bed towards somebody else, and I just kind of glossed over it, made an excuse, and didn't take care of it. See, we should be smart enough to know that if we hurt somebody's feelings, we should say, I'm sorry. If we act rude, we should say, I'm sorry. Not behave badly and then say, well, I had a rough day at work. You know, we make too many excuses for bad behavior, and what we need to do is let God deal with us about these things and say, no, God, I don't want to be like that, and I need you to help me. Nothing is worse than having a guilty conscience. John 4, 14, Jesus is talking with, we call her the woman at the well, and he says, whoever takes a drink of the water that I will give him shall never, no, never be thirsty anymore. But the water that I give him shall become a spring of water, welling up, flowing, bubbling, continually with him unto eternal life. I want you to just try to get a picture of that. What, how good is life when we've got, we just feel like life is bubbling us up in us and there's joy just bubbling up in us. And you know, I, I lived too many years where I'd get up in the morning and couldn't wait to go to bed and then go to bed at night and couldn't wait to get up. You know, I wasn't ever really satisfied with anything. And man, it became so important to me when I finally got a hold of John 10.10 and realized that Jesus didn't just die for me so I could someday in the sweet by and by go to heaven, 
but he died so we could have and enjoy our life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. And enjoying life does not mean that I'm gonna get everything I want or that I'm gonna live on vacation, I'm gonna have the perfect people in my life. Enjoying life means that there's a place in Christ that we can come to, a place of spiritual maturity where although we may not like our circumstances, nobody likes difficult circumstances, we still can find a place where we can be happy and joyful no matter what is going on in our life. And isn't that really what we want? Paul talked about it when he said, my determined purpose is to know him and the power of his resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while I'm in the body. That's exactly what we're talking about here today. He said there's a place that we can come to in Christ where with all the deadness around us and all the trouble and all the bad circumstances and the grouchy people and the high finances and all the things that are going on, where in him we can be lifted above that in a resurrection life. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 40 that when we wait on God, we will mount up with wings like eagles who mount up close to the sun. Well, if you've never really looked any further than just reading that scripture, you may not really understand the total beauty of it, but an eagle has an ability to fly so high, they're not afraid of the storms of life, they actually have tunnel vision and they can see miles and miles away when a storm is coming. And instead of running from it, or having a, a, a bad attitude or a fearful attitude, they actually wait for it to come and they let the, the draft of the storm, when it hits them, it pops them up above the storms and they can fly around in freedom and just look down at what's happening. Well, see, that's the way that we should be as believers. We don't have to run from problems, amen? And you know why? You have to have enough experience with God and it takes some time to get to this point. But honestly and truly, none of us like trouble, but if you love God and you want what he wants in your life and you don't give up, there's nothing, absolutely nothing that comes your way that God will not be able to take it and somehow or another work it out for your benefit in your life. The thing may not be good, but God is good. That doesn't mean that God brought your trouble, but he'll use your trouble to make you a stronger believer and to be a better witness to somebody else. How many of you are going through some things right now? Okay. Well, see, we have stuff too, you know. I had, in the last three years, I've had both of my hips replaced. Kind of nice now, you can get replacement parts, you know. And uh, uh, that's cool, so you know, you go through a healing process and blah, 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 blah. Well. I've been having a little issue with this one, and so they don't think it's my hip. They think now it could be something with my back. I've been having trouble with sciatic nerve. This morning, getting ready to come over here, I had this pain going down the back of my leg. Well, you know, my life's not perfect either, but I have to apply the same principles to my life that I encourage you to apply to yours. You, don't, you know, you don't get a pass from problems just because you're preaching the Word. Matter of fact, you get attacked more than if you weren't doing anything. But you know what, we do have authority over the enemy, and although he comes against us one way, he'll flee before us seven days. <laughs> Romans eight, right in the midst of all of these things, we are more than conquerors. You know what it means to be more than a conqueror? I believe it means that before your problem starts, you already know that whatever comes your way, you will ultimately have the victory. Amen? Okay. So I want to ask again, what's flowing out of you? Now, interesting thing. The Philistines, who are the enemies of the children of God, they had a way of doing warfare that also the Israelites did warfare the same way. Back in those days, one of the ways that you defeated your enemies was to throw dirt down their well. <laughs> See, you already know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> they would throw earth or dirt down their wells and stones 
pebbles and stones until they got it stopped up to where there was no water flowing out of the well. Another thing they did is they would throw stones all over their property so nothing would grow. Well, when I saw this scripture years ago, I taught this message once. I don't know why I've never taught it again because I think it's a great example, but Genesis 26, 15. Now all the wells which his father's servant had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the, his father, the Philistines had closed and filled with earth. So let's just say that earth represents the world in all of its ways. Well, if there's anything that the enemy wants to do, he wants to fill us, our inner life, with all the ways of the world. So even though we get up and go to church two or three times a week and we read our Bibles and we may give a little bit in the offering, there's still not much difference between us and the rest of the people out there because the enemy is constantly trying to fill us with the ways of the world. Does anybody seem to have any temptation these days about having to really stand steadfast and not get sucked into the system out there? And you know, many times, even as a believer, if you're going to really take a firm stand against ungodliness and against sin, you may have to be willing to stand alone a great deal of the time. 